Good evening and welcome. I'm Lori Carboneau, Executive Director of McLean Project for the Arts, and I'm thrilled to welcome you to our gallery tour this evening with Nancy Saucer and Sharon Fischel. That 2020 is a year of firsts is an understatement, I know we all know, but those firsts also include some real silver linings. For MPA, our Art Fest experience has been one of those silver linings. Of the many reasons it has, Several of them include the fact that we are able to connect the communities that we all serve in our Art Fest experience. We serve an exhibition community, we serve an education community, and we serve our art reach community. And tonight, whether you're joining us through our exhibitions or through MPA Art Fest, we welcome you. I'm thrilled that Nancy Saucer, our curator and director of exhibitions, is going to share with you the Sculpture Now exhibit of the Washington Sculpture Group that's in our Emerson Gallery at the McLean Community Center. After that, you're gonna have a real treat. And that's that Sharon Fischel, our Director of ArtReach is gonna for the first time share our ArtReach experience, our STEAM-based education experience that we bring to communities of special need, to adults, with, uh, adults in the senior community, as well as students around the county and around the region uh, annually. We bring about 3000 people into our gallery. And of course, the first this year is figuring out how to do that alternatively. And Sharon and Nancy both have taken first strides into their TV debut and uh, become filmmakers that are going to share that with us tonight. Thanks for being with us. Again, we welcome you and wish you a wonderful evening. Look forward to seeing you later. Hello, everybody, and welcome. Um, even those of you who are familiar with the MPA organization may not realize that we have a 50-year history of exhibiting artists working in the Mid-Atlantic region. Um, our galleries feature work, artists working in all mediums, directions, materials, and approaches. Um, and most exhibits feature solo, two-person, or small group ex uh, exhibits curated around an idea or, work or a concept. Once a year, we feature a juried exhibit with a call for artists reaching far and wide for submissions. It's a great way to exhibit a lot of artists at once and discover new artists that we are not yet familiar with. This year's juried exhibit, um, which we will feature here with a video uh, tour, um, is presented in partnership with the Washington Sculptors Group. And I just want to note um, before we go into the video that this is the first show post COVID. Enjoy. Welcome to McLean Project for the Arts. My name is Nancy Saucer. I am the curator and exhibitions director here. And um, I'm going to take you on a little tour today of the exhibition that we have in our galleries. Um, the exhibition is called Sculpture Now, and it's a juried show um, that was instigated and um, put on by uh, the Washington Sculptors Group in partnership with MPA. Um, they invited us to be the home for this show, uh, which is a, a group area uh, sculpture show that they do every other year. Um, and part of that was also inviting me to be the juror. So the way this show came about was um, the Washington Sculptors Group put out a call for entry. Um, many, 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 many sculptors um, uh, submitted their work to be part of the show. And then I came along and had the honor of looking at all the submissions. Um, thinking about which pieces should go in the show, um, which were the strongest ones, um, which had um, a real sense of completion um, and a mastery of, of skill and a sense of mystery and all of those good things combined together. Um, and I ended up picking over 50 artists to have works in the show, which is a lot of artists, but we have a big gallery. So um, it, one of the advantages that I had as both the juror and the curator of this space is that I know the space really well. So I was able um, to sort of go out on a limb, um, include a lot of work because there were so many good artists and good pieces. And I knew um, more or less how the space works, how the sight lines uh, draw out. And I was pretty sure I'd be able to fit everybody in. So um, success, we did fit everybody in. Um, it's a beautiful show. And um, as I said, there are over 50 artists, so I'm not going to be able to talk about each piece, um, but I am going to structure the show around a couple of different um, sort of commonalities so that, um, so that I can choose artists basically um, who have some, some spark 
um, between them. And um, I'll, I'll talk about those artists. Um, apologies to the artists who I won't get a chance to talk about, but there'll be lots of footage, um, so your works will be on view as we tour the gallery. The first category that I'm going to talk about are pieces that are performative or collaborative with, between the artist and the audience or the viewer. Um, this piece here is by Madeline Smith. Um, it is called Instrument for Connection and Compromise, and it actually is an instrument. It is made out of glass um, with a tremendous amount of skill, um, and it's, it's a beautiful object unto itself as a sculpture. It's very uh, lyrical. It has a sense of line. Um, although there is no color, it, um, it sort of the, the, um, the shape and the shine um, kind of work together to give it a, a real sort of sense of presence. Um, but the other thing to know about it is that it actually is an instrument and uh, numerous people can play this at once. So that leads back to the concept, the concept being um, it's important to be able to play well with others um, and that um, compromise and communication are um, paramount. This next piece is by Mark Robarge, also fall, falling into the category of um, performative or collaboration with, between the artist and the viewer. It's called Tree of Positive Actions, and he describes it as a call and response piece, again, between him and the viewers. Um, what he's doing is engaging viewers to express their thoughts um, on systemic racism, and he does that by asking them to write a positive action on these leaves, which are made out of lovely handmade paper, and clip them to this tree. Um, and you can see this is a beautiful tree, um, but done in a very, very um, in sort of um, impressionistic way. Um, you see the trunk just by the little bit of, um, the little bit of waving um, on the outside of this structure. Um, inside are, uh, is information and ideas about systemic racism. So as more and more people view this piece um, and interact with it and leave their thoughts, the leaves will fill out and the piece will change over time. Um, I love the way the monofilament or the fishing line works so that there's this sort of shine when the light hits it. The whole thing looks a little bit ethereal. And I think of it as sort of moving upward um, with a sense of hope for the future. Changing scales dramatically. The last piece I'm going to talk about in the performative um, audience collaboration um, category that I have uh, self-imposed here um, is uh, these two works by Louisa Neal. Um, the top one is called Counting Continuity, and the bottom one is called Capsule Number One. Um, this piece here um, is, is a good just demonstration of, of how the audience participation works. What she is trying to do is talk about big issues in a small way. So the size of these pieces um, is, is important to the concept. And she's interested in questions of worth, ethics, success, and how small choices matter. So she's offering the, uh, the audience the opportunity and a mechanism to make some small choices. These small chips can move out and around into different categories and different places within the piece, setting up a, um, an active visual metaphor for her conceptual underpinnings. As I mentioned before, I chose the works based on the quality of the actual individual pieces. Um, I didn't have an overriding concept that I was trying to fit the pieces into. Um, but when I stepped away and um, looked at the work once the show was installed, I did see a couple of um, a couple of things that really jumped out at me. And the thing that jumped out at me in the most lively way was that there were an incredible amount of pieces in the show that were either made out of textiles or fiber or used the process that is often part of the process of um, fiber-based work, which is weaving or building structure through repetitive motion or repetitive action. 
So now the next category that I have then is, is fiber-based or textile-based or um, somehow conceptually related to textile processed work. I want to introduce you to this piece by Sheila Kreider, um, the first in the fiber grouping. Um, this is called Frolicking. And um, it's, it's made primarily out of cloth, but the cloth is soaked with paint. Um, and she may use glue in there too, I'm not sure. But what that ends up doing is stiffening the cloth. Um, so she's combining painting with weaving and object building. Um, and you can see the weaving process um, with the cut strips. Um, and she is, it's like an embodied painting really, or a painting that's come to life and puffed up and, and entered the world that we live in as an object. Um, and the paint is both on it and in it. This is a piece by Christina Penhote. It's called As Respoken Lies Become Truths. Um, it's made out of wool, um, glass, silk, and thread, primarily wool, I would say. Um, and it is um, a real embracing of abstraction and the power of abstraction and almost, you know, um, the, the, the idea of the collective subconscious that, that you get when you read Jung um, and, and how those forms are common to us all and that we understand in a really basic way. Um, this piece, I find it very related to the body. Obviously, it looks a little bit like a womb um, or some kind of organ um, from some kind of fantastical creature, if not ourselves. I think there's sort of a body relationship that you have with it as a viewer. Um, you kind of feel it in your body when you look at it. Um, and um, it's, it's a compellingly beautiful, but with a slight little bit of revulsion, which I think is a, a wonderful kind of dichotomy and contrast. Um, and I would say that it is something that has really fully become an entity in its own. So I, I say that's a real success for the artist. This piece is by Annie Broderick, also in the fiber category, obviously. It's called Pleated Installation. Um, and it is made by embroidering and folding fabric. Um, and then it's attached to a grid. Um, there are 20,384 inches in this long stream of pleated fabric. Um, and she talks about um, exploring the concept of compression versus expansion of the self. Um, and um, it really sort of pulls in a lot of memories into this work, um, talking about growing up in the South, wearing those smock dresses, which are embroidered and pleated. Um, so this has kind of taken on a new form. Um, one of the things I love about this piece so much um, is the green glow um, because there is something about this I think it might be unsized fabric um, kind of raw cotton and it does have this green glow that gives it this sort of almost antiseptic and otherworldly kind of feel um, which I think is pretty powerful also the shadowing um, that you get with it is just tremendous um, when I saw this piece in the picture when I was choosing it it was not in this format it was really in a much more kind of loose draped um, long format but um, but I was I was happy to see this I think it's a really good solution for um, being able to hang a work like this this piece is by Jacqueline Maggi, also in the fiber category. Um, it's called Refuge. Uh, it's made out of mixed media um, from non-recyclable food packaging um, and also metal and uh, some plastic structure here. Um, but it has this wonderful lightness to it, um, this transparency. And because it has a door, see the door here, um, you do have a, a sort of a physical response to it and your imagination when you look at it sort of clicks in and takes you into that space, that refuge that she references, um, so that you can feel a, a, a sense of quietude, um, a, a nice feeling of emptiness, um, and um, sort of the, the, the idea of capturing a moment I think is, is a strong one in this piece. This piece is by Alonzo Davis. It's called Navigating Climate Change. 
Um, he's incorporating uh, recycled sail material, uh, referencing wind, of course, um, in, in the process. So there's textile there. Um, and then he's also using bamboo, which is a renewable wood, notably, um, and, and structuring it in a, in a weaving pattern that creates um, a kind of a window that has both structure and mass and also transparency at the same time. This piece is by Suk Young Park. Um, it's called Ebb and Tide, and it's important to remember that paper is a form of fiber. This is made um, through folding paper. Um, again, when I talked about creating form through repetition, I think this is a perfect example of that. Um, she is um, interested in remembered experiences, and um, the repetition of folding the paper is, uh, allows for a certain kind of meditative um, experience that is um, kind of uh, lends itself to um, processing memory. Um, she talks about um, uh, remembering kind of the beauty of a sunset and trying to kind of um, tag into that feeling over again. Um, the concept of duality, I think, is really very much here um, in similarity versus difference and simplicity versus complexity. The last piece I'm going to talk about that's related to fiber and textile is this wonderful piece by Yong Kyung Cho. It's called Planning and Unplanned Two. Um, and I might add, too, that this is not the last piece in the show that is related to fiber and textile. There are others, too, but I had to, I had to stop somewhere. Um, this is a piece that is made from found fabric, and the thing that's lovely about that is that the material has a history. So the material brings its, its history and its previous life to the piece as well. Um, and you probably noticed from some of the other pieces that I talked about that there are a lot of artists working with recycled materials today. Um, so that is, that is a you know, connection to our time and what's happening to, with us environmentally. Um, so there's a wonderful sort of slightly arbitrary but not completely arbitrary color interaction and color study going here. Um, obviously the artist has uh, intentions about um, what colors go where, but it's also just sort of a great cacophony of color. Um, and one of the things, um, again, duality comes up. Um, so you have, you have structure um, and um, sort of a, a little bit of a geometric underpinning um, juxtaposed with looseness and this wonderful drape that comes here. And then open-endedness juxtaposed with, with a knotted closure. Um, she... Um, I think um, is it really uh, connects with um, people's personal stories. Um, for me, this reminds me of my grandmother, who was a maker of braided rugs, which were also made out of um, recycled materials. Um, and there's a long history um, in every country um, in, in their sort of folk art tradition of working and making things out of recycled materials. Um, and I think the, the one thing that's wonderful when you bring a, a sort of a, a, folk, a folk reference to a, a piece of contemporary art is that um, there is this sort of quotidian um, uh, vibe to it that is rising out of something that is really about the everyday and celebrating the everyday. Leaving behind the fiber pieces, um, we uh, have several pieces here that I would categorize as a, as a little bit more focused on the formal aspects of um, the art vocabulary, interested in um, line, mast, texture, uh, form, um, and balance, um, those sorts of things. And really, these pieces celebrate their materiality. Um, the first one right here is called uh, Together a Mountain. It's by Paul Steinkoning. Um, it is wood and bronze together. So um, it's, it's about relationships. It's a metaphor for all different sorts of relationships, but very much about the relationship between these two materials and how these shapes fit together. This bronze piece actually comes off so that it is, it is sort of one piece nestled into the other. Um, so um, 
also the smooth and the texture are very important in this one and that they are creating both both um, harmony and tension at the same time. Piece in the middle here is by Steve Wanna. It's called One, One, Two, Three, and uh, it's plaster, wood, cord, magnet, and needles. Um, and I think it's, it's a lovely formal piece um, in terms of its structure and its sense of balance. There's a little precariousness to it, but it does have a surprise, kind of a, 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 a scientific and conceptual surprise, and that is that these cords here have needles on them and there's a magnet embedded in this wooden block so that these, the ends here with the needles are floating in space because of the pull and the power of the magnet. So it, it creates a really beautiful tension, um, which is both formal and conceptual. Um, and this piece here is called Shut Out um, by Gary Kret. Um, and it's cast bronze and um, carved uh, marble. So again, there's the contrast um, and the balance of those materials, the contrast between the feel of the bronze and um, the organic shape of the bronze and the very um, geometric um, and uh, pristine um, piece of marble and how those two, the, also the dark and the light, um, again, again, duality, beautiful pieces. Leaving behind the formal pieces, um, I'm going to finish up this talk with um, the work by two artists who really don't fit into a, a clear category. You might call them outliers a little bit, but in a wonderful sense. Um, but they both are very concerned um, and involved in the, the making process and just really you know, being in the joy of making. This is um, a work by Christopher Romer. It's called Charmers One. Um, the shapes that you see here are inspired by wooden fish decoys, but they have a lot of other references. You can think about, you know, main lobster pots, um, and, you know, um, they have also, um, they remind me of some of the bobbins in the sort of um, old mills in New England from the textile industry. Um, so there's this obvious love for workmanlike craftsmanship. Um, and a lot of care and a lot of time goes into making each one of these. Um, he, you know, he paints the surfaces um, and then he sands them down and paints them again so that they kind of build up this, this layer, this life layer. Um, also, you see a lot of um, tools um, that are from the carpentry world. You've got these wonderful copper nails um, and silver nails that are part of them as well. So. Um, they, they are a community, um, they, are, they, they work together, I think, in a really wonderful way and just kind of demonstrate sort of um, the, the joy of making things that are similar but, um, but also individual at the same time. And finally, the last piece I have time to talk about today is this piece by Marco Smith. It's called Plus Two Degrees Celsius, um, and it's made out of uh, wood, twine, paper, burlap, paper, pulp, stone, and glass. Um, I think of it as being made out of adobe almost, almost like something that was built from the earth. Um, it has such a feeling of um, something that you would find in nature, um, kind of part object, part being. Um, I have to say it's one of my favorite in the show. And it became almost like our mascot when we were installing this exhibition. <laughs> we always knew where he was and um, were um, very aware of his presence because he really does have a sense of presence. Um, and, and this again is, um, I think, an artist who is very interested in, in the process of making to the point where um, he has really kind of made his own material, um, which I think is, is sort of, you know, at the next step. Interestingly, um, his, he, he starts out by going out and finding, finding the sticks and the branches out in the outside, and he puts them together, and then it, sometimes they're okay by themselves, and sometimes he needs to fill in the negative spaces, the spaces between with something else. So you can see how this would evolve if you're, if you're using that kind of process and you're using that kind of thinking. So at any rate, we're very glad um, that this piece is here because he sort of looks out over the other pieces and offers a, a very um, unique and um, very natural perspective to the whole show. 
I want to thank you for taking this walk around the gallery with me. Um, unfortunately, we were only able to look at about half of the works, um, but there are many, many more, uh, which I'm sure you saw glimpses of. Um, there's just a tremendous amount of creativity and thought and skill um, present in this show, and it's a, it's a real honor to have it here in the gallery, um, particularly considering this is our first show back um, after being closed down for a while because of COVID. So thank you. I hope you get a chance to see the show. If not, take a look online. You can find it there as well. Hello, welcome. I'm Sharon Fischel, the director of the ArtReach program at the McLean Project for the Arts. And I'm delighted that you will all have the opportunity to view the ArtReach video. That's part of our Sculpture Now exhibition of uh, sculptors from the Washington Sculptors Group. These objects will give you ideas about sculpture and you might enjoy making some sculptures yourself after you view the video um, and in your classrooms and in your home. So I hope that you will enjoy watching the video and um, you might stay after to ask some questions if you have anything that you'd like to know. Thank you. Hello, I'm Sharon Fischel, the director of the ArtReach program at the McLean Project for the Arts, and I'm delighted to welcome you to our galleries today. Our ArtReach program services 3,000 participants each year, and through the program we learn to look at art of everyday objects as well as STEAM programming where we look at art and see science, technology, engineering, art, and math in the objects that we're looking at. In learning and thinking and looking at the art today, we're going to be thinking about storytelling and how all of these artists use objects to tell stories in their artwork. We also will be thinking about all the ways that these artists use the elements of art color, line, shape, texture, and mass. All the sculptures that we're looking at today are made from found objects in very different ways. And the first sculpture we're going to look at is by Mary Opasic, and it's called Trash Fish. And as we look at this sculpture, we can see some of the things that Mary collected on her walks through the woods, along streets in the city and through waterways. Uh, she loves to collect objects that she doesn't know what she's going to do with them until she starts to create sculptures. So some of her objects she picks up because she's just attracted to what they look like. This trash fish is filled with all kinds of objects like a Lego, keychains, springs, buttons, keys, things that she finds in her walks, even a broken bottle cap that she collects that she's attracted to. And she puts them in her collection and later when she starts to make work, she decides which objects she's going to use. Um, she's also thinking about how fish are very vulnerable in our waterways and they end up eating a lot of the trash that people drop into the water. So part of her work refers to ecological issues as well. She's also used various objects to make this fish. She uses a horse harness and uh, chair parts and a shoe stretcher and a variety of other materials that she has bent into the shape of the fish that you're seeing today. If you were going to make a sculpture out of found objects, what objects would you use and what would you fill that sculpture with? Our next sculpture is by Stephen Dobbin and it's called Working Man's Collective. Stephen Dobbin works in steel and as you can see, he 
has figures that have a beautiful texture that is a rusted surface that he cuts out of sheets of steel. He is also a teacher and he works with special needs students and he often talks about repetition as something that's important to his art. He believes that when you repeat a subject that people tend to remember it and he's interested in how people think about memory. He also is interested in work as a theme. And here you can see that the figures are holding objects, a chair, a saw, a broom, a ladder, a cart, and that they're on their way to work. And he thinks that work is very important for community. And he tells his students, he has a little motto that he shares with them that he also relates in this particular artwork. Uh, he says, be present, show up, do a good job and feel good about it. And that gives us all a sense of community. And here, as we look at this work, we can feel the sense of community. And also there's a sense of movement in his figures. That is something that he likes to bring out in his sculpture. In this sculpture by Sophie King, we're looking at um, an artist who uses materials that both make us think of the present and of the past. Um, she uses crystals, and you can see the texture of those crystals. Um, and she also likes to think about science and gathering things from nature and mythology and what certain objects meant in the past. So she has a lot of contrasts in her raw materials that she selected to create this horse. This is called Trojan Geode. And you can see that the crystals are very mysterious because they're filled with light and you can see through them. They're transparent, but they're also heavy. And she's contrasting that material with the raw roughness of the rock that's behind the horse. The horse might make you think of a mythological creature, perhaps like the Greek mythological horse Pegasus, who also had a magical quality. So there's something sometimes seemingly magical about some of the objects that she creates. She likes to collect objects that refer to science, nature, and mythology. We are now looking at the work of Craig Craft. And as you can see, this sculpture also deals with light, but in a very different way. He uses neon light. And the name of this piece, it's called Damaged Spirit of the African Elephant. And as we look at it, we can see that he has really used line as a way to define the elephant's head and the mass of the head. And it's made of aluminum tubing and neon light. And he uses the red as a way to accentuate the tusk forms. He has traveled to many different parts of the world and he has visited Africa where he has seen elephants. And he is also concerned about the endangered species of elephants. We are now looking at the sculpture of Jackie Crochetta, and we are noticing that it has a very um, dramatic presence in the gallery. This sculpture is called In the Shelter of Each Other. Jackie uses found natural materials. She's using stones and sticks and dowels and paint and glass to create this work which refers to the vulnerability of animals in forest fires and also during floods as one of its messages. And we can see that color and line and shape are very important in this sculpture. 
that she's created. If you were to create a sculpture that was about a shelter with an animal in it, what shape would you use to create the shelter and what animal would you put inside of it? Something to think about. We are now looking at the sculpture entitled Rising Tides by Ruth Losner. And it also has a protective house-like shape. However, this sculpture is constructed to look like an object. Um, and it has a multi-layered house shape. And as you can see, starting on the bottom, there are ladders and stairs that can lead your eye through the space. And there's also texture in the way that she's painted the surface of the object. As your eye goes up, you can also see on the inside that there is some blue glass. And being that it's called rising tides, it might make us think of how the tides are rising along the coastal areas um, in many parts of our country. So the house seems both protective and also maybe vulnerable. We also see a painted moon shape on the side of the roof, which might refer to the moon and the tidal rhythms that are often a part of being by the water. So I hope that you have enjoyed seeing the sculpture today in our exhibition, Sculpture Now, and that it can give you ideas about how to use found objects to make your own sculptures that will tell your own stories. Hello. Um, Thanks for watching that. I hope you uh, enjoyed it. We enjoyed making it, um, making those videos. It was a, it was a new challenge for us um, and one that hopefully we'll have a chance to do again. Um, now, Sharon and I are just here for a little bit while longer and um, we're happy to answer any questions you might have. If you have anything you wanna ask about the show, um, just type it into the, um, the chat and um, we'll, we'll see if we can, uh, we can answer what you need to know. Okay, any questions? That's okay. Um, we, did, we did talk a long time. So um, hopefully you enjoyed um, a little bit of a deep dive into the work. Um, I wanna thank you all for being here. Um, and um, I want to really thank you for being part of MPA Art Fest, this first virtual version, um, which we have really worked hard to put together for you. Um, and um, I hope you'll keep watching. Um, we have lunchtime artist interviews um, and also um, music in some of the, on some of the evenings, phenomenal music. Um, and also shopping, don't forget the shopping. Um, we have over 52 artists in the show. Um, and you can find them online um, and find out more about them and see a whole grouping of their works, which are available for sale. Um, Art Fest goes on until the end of the week. Um, and um, I hope you otherwise just keep participating in Art Fest and um, participating in all our MPA programming. Um, and also remember that the Sculpture Now uh, exhibition is open. Um, through November 14th by appointment. So um, you do need to make an appointment to come in and see it. Um, and we hope to see you at the gallery. Thanks a lot.